You swear it's the other end of what? I don't know. It's got to be like roll 20 or something. Because I was there Thursday. And now I'm not. I didn't change anything. Yeah, it doesn't say exploit like normal, like when it's not working, right? Uh huh. And she's all lit up. And now I'm not. I didn't change anything. What's the browser you're using? Yeah, it doesn't say exploit. Uh, same one I always use. Chrome. Uh huh. And she's all lit up. Man, it should work. I know. That's what I'm saying. And it...
All right, everybody, welcome to another game. Uh, on Today, it's on Sunday. We're playing a one-shot with friends from YouTube. Uh, we're going to be playing... Um... All right, everybody, welcome oh, to got another got an echo because of Twitch. Game. Hold on. Hey, it's on Sunday. We're playing Nothing ever goes right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> so. You have no idea how many streams I've started with that echo. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're always trying to check to see if it's on because that's that's like the it probably was like in I don't know like 80s maybe early 80s when everybody was starting to get cell phones and they were really big and huge and so they would people would be like can you hear me wait can you can you hear me now are you there you know and now they're so good you don't do that anymore but Twitch has brought it back for me so. <laughs> um, okay so we have a one shot for you guys today. We have a couple of regular faces that you've seen if you're used to my channel, and we have a couple of new faces, and we're going to get to introduce everybody. But let's, before uh, we get to our characters, we'll get there in just a second. You can kind of you can see a little bit of them up on the um, screen in just a moment. But let's give you a little rundown of what we're going to try to play today. So today, we are starting an adventure in the lands of Velen. So Velen is a peninsula kind of in the south, much further south on the Sword Coast than, than many have seen in the Forgotten Realms. Um, kind of a jungly atmosphere, lots of pirates around, um, lots of interesting intrigue, temples and ruins and all kinds of uh, things to be had towards the south. And we're, we're a little bit north of Chol, which is kind of what is the big thing that's going to be coming out in a couple months from Dungeons & Dragons as they release their next um, area that they kind of focus on. So I thought this would be a good chance to put an adventure near there. So we're going to play that today. And in Velen, we're going to be on the southern coast of Velen, if you happen to be looking at a map. Um, and on that southern coast, we will be in the, the fishing town of Salt Break. And uh, our adventurers will be starting from there. So it's going to be pretty fun. So let's jump into introducing our characters. Let's start with uh, a little bit of introduction out of character. So these are uh, some friends from YouTube now. We have, as you can see on the screen, we'll start, I guess, with just the videos that we have. Let me move us over to our actual screen. How about that? So you guys can see a little bit. There we go. So we'll put uh, Graybeard on the spot. He's our first one. So Graybeard's a Twitch and YouTuber. He's gonna be joining us today. Go ahead and give us a little bit about maybe what's on your channel and some of the stuff you do. Hail, hi, howdy everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm old Graybeard. Um, I'm a variety streamer. Uh, I like playing Dungeons and Dragons though, as now I run one campaign, not on the air, just for the dear house elves and tavern dwellers. And then, um, I play in at least two and hopefully three and five and seven as many D&D &D campaigns with Lucian as I can because he's an awesome DM and uh, that's what I do. My YouTube is kind of kind of dead at the moment because I lost my, my partner in, uh, in the YouTube business. So hopefully I'll learn the ropes and get some more content out. And then am I supposed to introduce my character too? Nope, we'll come around to that All in right. just a sec. Yeah, that's so. me. Yeah, so definitely check him out. He's, he is streaming. Uh, in fact, when are you streaming, though? At least mention that oh. so people can find you. Um, so uh, <laughs> if I'm not on Thursday nights with Lucian, I'm on Friday nights uh, for the Hearthstone Happy Hour. I usually play digital cards. So I'm on Saturday morning for Sci-Fi Saturday. I play everything from, you know, uh, Star Citizen to uh, I just played StarCraft uh, last week, like original StarCraft. And um, then I do a talk show on Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Gear, one of the tavern dwellers. And uh, then Monday nights with Lucian and Thursday nights with Lucian. Awesome. A lot, a lot of streaming. <laughs> yeah, the mon yeah, and uh, right now the, the Mondays and Thursday games are, are really good. So if you yeah. haven't seen them, for me too, that's the uh, Monday night streaming on Sir Lucian Twitch and on Mixer at this point. Um, you can find me, but I also put all the videos up on YouTube. So moving over, we have PB Plays Inside from YouTube. Uh, go ahead. She puts up a lot of videos, and she's kind of a, a Minecrafter. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about the stuff you're doing, PB. Yes, I do a lot of Minecraft. Um, I do a lot of D&D, &D, just like Greybeard. On Mondays, I play Storm King's Thunder with Sir Lucian as our DM and Greybeard as a player. 
on Thursdays, same thing. Another uh, a small little campaign over there on Sir Lucian's channel, <laughs> and um, I just play a lot of D and D. I play a lot of Minecraft. I play over on a thing called the STBN server, and maybe some Rocket League soon. I don't know. I'm also trying out streaming for the first time in my life over on YouTube. So, um, you know, you could go tell me how awful or great it is. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. So uh, moving over, our first guest who's not in one of Sir Lucian's campaigns. We had to get somebody that wasn't already playing in my other 5, 10, 20 campaigns. <laughs> we have uh, Jordan. So Jordan, you're doing a, quite a bit on your YouTube. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your channel. Um, I run a YouTube channel um, called Forgotten Realms Explained. If you search my my name, uh, Jordan, with a silent PH in the middle, you'll find it. And uh, our goal is to create digestible bites of D&D &D lore. So we're kind of making these little uh, eight-minute videos every week that take some aspect of D&D &D lore and try to explain it and make it um, useful for you for future DMs. And then I've started a kind of a bi-weekly vlog of my personal game that I'm running of White Plume Mountain. So, yeah. Yeah, awesome. So thank you and welcome to the game. Yeah, and thank you. Not, certainly not the least at all, but at the, at the end of our little uh, cameras here, we have Magpie Randoms, who's also doing YouTube channel. And uh, go ahead, Magpie, tell us a little bit about you and some of the stuff that you're putting up on your channel. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to the game. Um, I'm a relatively new YouTuber. Um, I've got quite a small but growing channel um, dedicated mainly to Baldur's Gate games, but increasingly D&D &D as well. Um, I'm quite new to actually playing D and D, so and I'm completely new to Roll Twenty, so this is a brand new experience for me. Um, so I'm really excited. So thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, great to have you. There's only one way to jump in, and that's with both feet and just do it yeah. all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the same where I did, had never used Roll Twenty before, had never hadn't done streaming too much, and then decided I wanted to run a, a role playing campaign just learn the fifth edition rules, just learn how to use Roll20, just learn how to stream. I mean, it was like a mess. Mm -hmm. Don't ever do that if anybody's out there. Like, <laughs> do them one at a time. <laughs> so, all right. So let us jump in. So now we have our, our players, but now we should introduce our characters. But before we do that, we have to add in a fifth character. Um, and our fifth character is our town of Saltbreak, because it's kind of a character of its own. So for those of you that are tuning in and listening up, um, what is this whole salt break and, and what is it? So this is a town, uh, a decent sized fishing town, has several uh, large docks for merchant ships that come in. It's a place that's known for exporting pearls. There's quite a few popular pearl beds near here um, and those get exported to all over uh, the Sword Coast area. There's also, uh, they do a lot of sea salt manufacturing here and various fish fish species that they import up back up to the north and they bring in all the stuff that they don't have um, from there. And this is where our adventurers have been living or have grown up um, in their time. We'll see that when they introduce them. Now, the one thing that makes this stand out is not only is uh, Salt Break the town, but it's also the home of the Salt Break Adventuring Company. And that's what our group has joined. The, uh, the Salt Break Adventuring Company was something that was created by the town when many years ago, uh, they had a, a tragedy happen when several youngsters, several mid-teens who had been growing up on um, stories and legends of heroes and adventurers decided that they wanted to be adventurers and that they were going to go out and find adventure on their own. And they gathered stuff from around the town that they could find. They cobbled together what they thought was armor, weapons and gear and rope that they would need. And they decided that they would go out and find their own adventure but tragedy struck when they were inside of a ship that had wrecked um, on the beach and it had mysteriously capsized over and the, the youngsters had drowned. And the town was quite distraught with the idea that um, these youngsters had, you know, died and nobody really had known what they were doing or where they were, or what was going on. And so they kind of formed together. They, got, they came together and as a town might... And they said, we should make some rules. So it's, it's kind of like that if you want to jump out of character. It's almost like um, uh, Kevin Bacon's movie about dancing. 
not in my head at the moment. Footloose. Footloose. I keep saying flash dance, and I'm like, he's not in flash dance. He's not in flash dance. Footloose, where they where the town has a tragedy and they make laws that say nobody can party or dance because that leads to people dying. So we had this group of people come together and say nobody should adventure, nobody should tell stories and anything because our we don't want our young people to go off and, and die horribly trying to find this really dangerous adventure. But then there was a bigger group that said there's no way we're never going to be able to convince the young the youngsters not to go out and adventure. It's just always going to happen. They're always going to hear stories. There's nothing that we can do. So instead of banning adventuring, which we won't be really be able to do, they'll just sneak off and do it anyways. Why don't we support them and find a way to help them? So what they did is they created the Salt Break Adventuring Company and they allow anybody that's over 16 or older to join the Salt Break Adventuring Company. And the company itself provides training and equipment and gear so that they're ready when they go out into this dangerous world and they're not just kind of sneaking off unprepared. So they're doing as much as they can to help them be successful. So that's kind of the backdrop of where we're gonna start and that will allow us to kind of jump into our character introduction. So if we start again over on, the, on my screen all the way over to the left besides me, then we have Greybeard. So let's go ahead and hear Greybeard's introduction of the character he will be playing today. <clears throat> All right, today I'll be playing Blaze Emberheart, Battle Master. Um, you may, you may, <laughs> sorry, you may know me from such adventures as Solving the Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, or the time I dared to defy the danger of Dunwater. I'll watch your back. That's Blaze. <laughs> nice, nice pitch. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Everybody is, uh, for those watching, the everybody, our characters are third level as we're starting, just to keep that in mind um, as we go. So that brings us to PB. Go ahead and give us a little taste of what character you'll be playing today. I am Yaretsi Venus Brightfalls, a tabaxi who's lived on the streets since she was young, but now I'm here, ready to make the place a better, a better tomorrow for everyone. And... Uh, just uh i'm a rogue so i can slink in and out of every corner just like when i did when i was young <laughs> nice and i'll never be able to pronounce your name the way you do so <laughs> <laughs> i will butcher that we think of pb as kind of our resident linguist who who studies all of that in fact our our, our adventure oh lord um, don't make me do it which i have to let me let me pause a second our adventure is let me play it for our group yeah, McLancy Wattle is the name of our <laughs> Mc, McLancy Wattle Smiles. <laughs> and uh, PB helped me figure out the pronunciation of that. <laughs> so, and maybe that'll give you a hint of the kind of adventure we're about to have. So, um, Okay, so moving on, we have uh, Jordan. What kind of character did you bring to play today? So I've got a Goliath death cleric named Egleth Doromir. Um, and he is a priest of Loviatar, who is known as the Maiden of Pain. And Loviatar is all about, uh, like, having pain and, and pain against others and things like that is all forms of worship for her. So uh, an evil deity, but I'm not necessarily evil. My tribe just kind of values the, the pain that helps you grow and gets through life. So he's from the indeterminate south, heading north to Valin for seeking adventure and um, pain to worship his god. Awesome. And then that brings us up to Magpie. What kind of character did you bring today? Okay, so today I'm playing a halfling wizard called Griselda Goodsoup. And <laughs> Griselda... <laughs> Um, Griselda is obsessed with food. Um, she is the best cook in Salt Break, so good that the mayor actually hired her to cook in his kitchen. Um, she comes from quite a poor family. The good soups are very well known, but they don't have much money and there's lots of them. Um, so she's been quite limited in how far she can take her culinary prowess. And she joined the adventuring company to get out and find some rare ingredients, new tastes, and become the best she can be. She's a guild artisan in the, in the Bakers and Cooks Guild. So she wants to be the best cook she can be and kind of famous. So that's where she is. Awesome. So we have quite the, the group going here. So that's good. So we have... Uh... 
I go back. So we have a human, a goliath, a halfling, and a tabaxi. So that should be pretty fun. <laughs> All right, so let's move you guys over and bring you to Salt Break itself. Take a look at that. And welcome to the fishing town of Salt Break, where everything is nice and bright colors. And um, it's a very secure port town, although uh, there are pirates out in the oceans quite often. Uh, they don't ever seem to raid inland. Uh, the walls keep the everything that's in the dark forest out. And again, we're on the southern shores of Velen. Now, you may know Velen is actually a town name. It's actually a city name, too. But it's also in the land of Velen. Um, but that's to our north, and we won't actually get up to there too much. But we open our day on a bright and sunny morning after our adventurers have finished their training. When they joined the Salt Break Adventuring Company, they were given one year to train and equip themselves. And this is why they have some of the skills and some of the abilities that they have. Because the town pools together and hires either trainers or guides or, you know, um, tutors, those kinds of things. and brings them together to make sure that anybody that's joining the adventure has all the skills they could need to go out into this dangerous world. So a year has gone by where these adventurers have honed their skills here in Salt Break. And for the first time, uh, they are... Let me bring back my notes over here a second. For the first time, they are summoned to the Elder's uh, Hall, where they meet with the... the Kind of the voice of the Elders at the moment is uh, Marcella, Elder Marcella. And she has summoned you um, on a nice bright morning to say today will be the day today we're going to send you on a mission you've been training you've been itching to get out there into adventure and now it is time and so she has you seat in this kind of the elders office and there's it's like the the place where the elders meet and it's a big table with chairs and she has you sit down um, and they bring you refreshments and uh she says I've been keeping track of your training, and I realize all of you are anxious to get out into the world, so we will send you out today. We had a report from a fisherman that two days to the east, there's a ship wrecked upon the beach. And she pauses, and this is something that would probably all of you um, would think about a little bit more, just because you realize the first thing you learned when you joined the Salt Break adventuring company is the history in that the tragedy of you you have to learn the four people that perished and that they died in a shipwreck and this is a you know it's a a thing that the town still to this day um, mourns over these these lost children and uh so she has a very serious look as she pauses almost a moment of silence kind of pause and you, and you're you're sure that inside your head and even in her head she's reciting the names of of those that have perished. And then she continues and says, this is an ominous first mission to send you on, but we believe you have the skills necessary to make sure that not only is this shipwreck safe for the fishermen to come in and haul off the beach, but to be sure that nothing will happen for anyone that might stumble upon it. We cannot just leave it out there. And so she looks at you. So she says to you, so I, implore you to gather your gear make sure you have your provisions packed and as a test and your final test is to hike over along the coast find the shipwreck and be sure that it's cleared out and safe and that so that the fishermen may come and pick it up and then she kind of waits to see if there's any questions from from the the group well, that's easy. No problem. Is your goal to get the ship in working order again, or just to make it a safe area? Our goal is to make it safe. We know that the last time somebody entered a shipwreck on the beach, those souls never made it back. And to this day, we still do not know how they perished or why they perished. It's only that we found their bodies several days later. 
So we do not wish this to happen again, and we wish to send those that have more skills to be sure that nothing will happen. Sounds exciting. Sounds like a excellent plan. Uh, some some pain for Loviatar. So I am gladly. I will gladly accept this mission. Great. So she nods and, and takes a look at all of you and then says, um, <coughs> well, "If there is nothing further, be sure to gather all your equipment that you need. I'm sure the merchants are fully stocked for anything that you might be missing." And then. Hopefully, we will see you in a few days' time. Hiking there probably will take you two days, she, she kind of says, because she's not completely sure. Um, so she says, we'll expect to see you within a week. Okay. And then, yeah, she kind of just allows you to continue with your refreshments, and then you are able to amble on your way um, to gather your equipment gear up and get anything last minute that you may need. I don't know about you three, but I came here ready to roll. <laughs> I believe I have everything I need. I mean, does anybody else need anything? I have a cooking pot. I have a spoon. That's all I need. <laughs> I, I always want to be in your adventuring group because if you can eat well, <laughs> that's, that's more important than anything. An adventuring company marches, marches on their stomach, let me tell you. <laughs> the only thing I can think of that I personally don't have is rope. Rope always seems to be advantageous. Does anybody have some rope? I have rope. Yes. Excellent. I have rope. What kind, what kind of pack do you have? Um... Uh, let me see. I think it's an explorer's pack. 50 feet of hemp rope. Yes. There, there it is. Jorfton. Or, uh, <laughs> oh, Sorry. Snap. Sorry. We have all our names, our other names, <laughs> our character names on all ours. So, uh, Egl Egleth, what kind of pack do you have? Uh, <laughs> that is an excellent question. I have a priest pack. No rope in there. Hmm. No rope. Well, I have an explorer's pack. Plenty of rope. Awesome. All right. Uh, so you are all suited up and ready to go. And it's it's mid morning when you um, start your track, and you enter what's kind of along um, the coastline. You can follow the coast. Now it doesn't wind like in a straight line, but you're not exactly sure where on the coast you're going to find this um, shipwreck. So you follow it um, anyways, just so that you won't miss it if you're trying to you know save time going the overland. As you march and you go, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk about what this looks like for our group. So our, our group is, for the first time, now you've probably done some training together. You've probably worked together as the adventuring group has put you together. In the Salt Break Adventuring Company, they have what are called bands. And these are groups of adventurers that work together a lot. And you guys are part of a band. Um, and so you've done some kind of group exercise together along with any of the training that you might have done separately. So when trekking through the woods, um, and you know that this is a dangerous area, although the town is bright and secure, you know, even just a couple hundred yards outside of the city walls can be dangerous. Um, what does it look like as you're traveling along the beach? Is it like a, a single file kind of trek? Is everybody walking abreast or is it two by twos or how does this group travel? Hmm. Well, we've trained together, um, so I imagine that uh, I, I I would prefer to walk next to Egleth, and you know, because he's big and he's got a shield, and um, I do not have a shield. I just have big weapons, and uh, I think it would be better best for. Um, Griselda to, to try to stay behind the Goliath until it's magic time. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and even though sometimes uh, Yaretsi makes me uh, uncomfortable because I can't hear her behind me, um, she probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably uh, you know, can leap out from behind uh, the two bigger guys of us. So maybe two by two if nobody minds. Yeah. I think that's good. Freebeard, what is your character name again? 
Oh, uh, I'm, I'm Blaze, Blaze em Emberheart. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, two by two sounds great. I'll stand next to Blaze. Awesome. So heading down the beach, and it's a. If you were to stop and kind of just enjoy the scenery, this is kind of a tropics beach. Um, the water has a beautiful color to it. The the rhythmic tides and the, and the waves crashing against the rocks or the sandy beaches as you go is is mesmerizing and it's a very peaceful place um and that's it's on kind of on your right hand side as you're heading east the ocean is on your right hand side and then on your left hand side is this dark kind of jungle forest that is pretty thick and you hear the sounds of all kinds of animals and birds and then at times you hear it go quiet and then each of you maybe slowly put your hands to your weapons as things as you wait and you look and then nothing happens and then you move on and you continue and it's a pretty standard um feeling for you when walking through these woods um you know these this place can be dangerous but you also know that you've been trained and you know to keep a lookout and you and you're confident adventurers you know you you're here for adventure that's what you're looking for so you travel your first full day and you start to see the, the sun go down, and you're going to make your first camp upon... Tell me a little bit about this. Now, would your, would your group want to camp on the beach? Would your, camp, would your group want to camp a little in the woods? What would they look for when they're looking for their campsite? I think I would want to camp a little more in the woods to have um, protection from the elements. Mm. Okay. Yeah, same. So yeah, so you guys are keeping an eye out uh, a little bit into the woods. You're you're looking for a, a spot. You're looking for maybe trees to to set under, and it's a pretty thick um, foliage that you you know you would have to kind of crash through to really make it. And every now and then there's deer trails or or animal trails of whatnot. But you come upon, upon a place where you think is a is a pretty good camping site, one that you've done many times before, as far as the the type of area you're looking for. And you begin to set up camp. So maybe, maybe tell us what setting up camp looks a little bit like, and that gives our viewers a little chance to get to know you guys. So what's camp setup look like for you? Uh, since we're in a jungle climb, climb, uh, uh, Blaze has a hammock. His bedroll is like a, a, a netted hammock, and he puts it between two trees, and um, you know, starts to swing back and forth. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Maybe he he's got his mall uh, his mall out one side and he's kind of rocking himself and he's munching an apple, uh, and then we've got maybe a low fire because we don't need a fire for heat just for cooking, mm. but uh, I'll leave that to Magpie to figure that out. Yeah, uh, she's um, poking the fire and getting the pot nice and hot. She kind of casts Blaze a little bit of an annoyed look and saying, "You're going to you're going to spoil your dinner." If you keep eating, <laughs> gotta keep I've my worked energy up. Hard on this chowder, okay? <laughs> I've collected all these shells from the sea as we've been walking, and I'm making a mean chowder. So don't spoil your dinner. And she kind of looks <laughs> just one, <laughs> just one apple. It's... <laughs> and I, I like munch it real quick and chuck the car into the woods. <laughs> awesome. What about uh, Yaretsi? What she do when camp is getting set up? Oh, that was good. That was a good pronunciation. Um, I am uh, in. I'm close by the food. I'm m mouth watering, thinking about the f amazing food um, mm -hmm. our resident halfling makes. But I am. Uh, I'm looking past. I'm looking at and then past the food out into the wilderness, just making sure there's uh, nothing awful down there. All right, so wa definitely watchful, but also staying near the food. Awesome. And then, um, so it's Eglath or Elglath? I did uh, Eglath. 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 All right, let me write that down. I'll get that right. Perfect. So what does Eglath do when, when camp starts to get set up? Um, I think he's probably going to take out a bedroll, which is really just a glorified thick blanket because he's pretty used to sleeping on the ground. Um, and if there's a, a larger leaf nearby, like one the size of, of me or like five feet tall, he'd probably try to take that leaf and tie it to a stick to create some kind of shade from the sun. 
<laughs> nice. Okay. And then mostly just stretching out his sore muscles, waiting for um, dinner. Perfect. Yeah. So um, we see camp. Everybody's kind of gets their stuff set up. Uh, Griselda's been. Um, tell us a little bit. So you're making the chowder. Tell us a little bit. Of, is there a lot more prep going on? Is this like a big production, or are you like one of those cooks that's really good at using minimalist stuff? Um, I've been picking up stuff that I've found along the way, um, and it's all very well thought out. Um, she's a little bit obsessional. Things have to be just right. She is a bit of a, of a perfectionist. And she's a very friendly halfling, but if anyone goes near her cooking implements, she kind of gives them the eye and <laughs> the spoon intimidatingly. So she likes to do things her way. Um, so it is quite involved. You know, she's putting bits of this, bits of that. She's looking around for herbs. She's picking them up. She's putting them in. It's going to be fabulous, but nobody else quite knows what she's doing. It looks like something very carefully orchestrated. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and when we get to the end, you have everything ready. Talk a little bit about, like, the presentation. So is it, like, on these, like, wooden plates, and then it's, it's like, uh, at a chef's place? Or is it, you know, give us a little description of what you're handing out to the players. So I'm handing out wooden bowls, which I'm ladling the chowder into, and I'm um, giving them big troughs of crusty bread to kind of hunk up their, their chowder with and eat. Um, and it smells absolutely delicious. It's steaming. <laughs> coming I can from smell it, and I'm hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> my battery's about to go. I'm just going to plug in my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we have a wonderful uh, meal, and would it be a talkative group? Do you guys chit-chat? Do you kind of keep to yourselves, do you think? I think I keep to myself mostly some some silent prayers to my God. Okay. More of an <laughs> introspective group. Yeah. Blaze talks enough for everyone. <laughs> so he Let just me... drones on. <laughs> and everybody's already used to just kind of tuning him out. Gotcha. <laughs> So, um, so nightfall is about to happen, um, and we're going to, and this scene, then we're setting up the scene just so you guys, uh, for those that are watching and, and those that you might see this on YouTube, get an idea of how our group kind of handles their day-to-day -day function and how they travel and a little bit about them. And so the sun's about to go down. Does this group, uh, set watches? Does this group just trust in the gods to keep them safe at night? How's that work? I don't know. I'd, I'd lean towards setting a watch, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the best idea, I would think, personally. Well, let me tell you, if we had some elves, they could just trance. They'd do this trance thing and they're awake, but yet they get their rest. If only we had some elves. If only. Uh, You're channeling a different character. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take first watch. I'll take second watch. How many watches do we need? Four. <laughs> Four. Oh, I'll take third watch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take last. Uh, can Perfect. any of you see in the dark? Yes. Ooh, good question. No, I don't think halflings can. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I can. No, I don't think so. Oh, I can. <laughs> I know. That's why I was. That's why I was asking. I was like, ooh. Uh. <laughs> but that like real adventures. None of those cheaty elves again. <laughs> <laughs> Light the torch the old-fashioned way. Yeah, keep your fire blazing so you can see out. Although I do have the cantrip light, so nice. That helps, I suppose. All right, so uh, we have an uneventful night as Blaze begins the watch and then Eglith takes over and then wakes uh, Griselda on third watch who then uh, allows uh, your Etsy to handle the final watch and then wakes everybody up in the morning and then you're able to clear your camp and you're a pretty fastidious group you like clean up after yourselves you've been taught well in the salt break uh, adventuring company to um, you know kind of keep nature the way it is even though you're adventurers and you pack your stuff up and you're ready to start tracking down the the beach again 
And then it's near the end of the second day, not quite sundown, when you come along the side of the beach and you see, you get your first sight of a ship resting on the beach in a little cove. Let's bring you over to that. Oh, nice. Mm. That was sweet. So you yeah. see a ship, um, and, and the picture's pretty close as far as the, um, but the hole is actually on the other side on the beach side. So as you come up to it, there's a beach area that leads up to this big hole in the side of the ship. The ship has, as you can see here, um, there's moss and, and seaweed and kelp, dried up kelp um, hanging from it. It definitely has a lot of rot. It looks like it's um, been kind of a derelict ship for quite a while. And for those of you, I mean, most of you have either been around the coast quite a bit or grew up on the coast. Um, you're, you're used to nautical things. You're used to seeing ships and what they should look like or not. And you can tell this is probably a ship that is, has definitely seen better days. It definitely looks like it's it's been derelict for a, for a very long time. Um, and you probably are, it's still to the east of you as you're looking at it. You're probably two or 300 feet along the beach and the beach curves around to where the boat is. So you're still quite a ways from it at when you get your first sight. Okay. Um, anything out of the ordinary on the beach wise? Like, are there any creatures running around or anything? Yeah, as you begin to, to take a look um, without not moving closer, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So from here, the one thing you do notice, the 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 ship kind of captures your eyes first and even just the cove itself and, and the way the water looks pristine and the beach is a nice clean beach and just even the mountains in the area here. It's a beautiful sight, even though you have this kind of derelict ship sitting here. Um, but then you notice too, a little bit just before it, there appears to be a fishing skiff pulled up onto the beach with nobody around. Hmm. Hmm. This whole thing screams trap. Yaretsi, do you want to take a better look? Yeah, that's going to be to your left. So you guys are looking and um, it kind of curves around like in a crescent moon almost um, in front of you. If you stay on the beach, you're not going to see much cover on the way there. It's a lot of sand. There's a few rocks and stuff here, but not a ton of cover as a, as a beach approach. But if you were to go up into the woods some and then kind of curve around, you would be able to keep your eye on the ship, but be in the woods by say 20 or 30 feet, which would afford you cover as you get closer. Okay, so let's have our first roll of the game so far. How about a stealth roll from our rogue? <laughs> okay. Ooh. And then nails it. Yeah. Hey, each, play, char yeah. each character is different, man. So, um, and I know we do have some new people to roll 20. So the way she did that is she had her character sheet open and then on her character sheet, um, there's a list of the skills. And so when she wanted to do the roll, she just clicked the word stealth and it went ahead and did the roll for her and put it up in um, roll 20 for us. Now it rolled two times. This is a good question from Jordan earlier. And for any of those that are watching that haven't used roll 20, it will always roll two dice. If it's a regular roll, you just take the first one. If you have advantage for some reason, you get to take the highest one. If you have disadvantage for some reason, and I'll tell you if you do on a roll, then you would take the lowest one. In this case, it was a regular roll, so she gets to take her very first one, which is 24, which is a fantastic roll. Nobody, when she goes 10 feet into the woods, even you guys can't see her. She is just <laughs> gone. It's like she never existed as she slinks through the woods. In fact, she can do it whether she's in the treetops, through bushes, shadows, whatever. She gets to make it up. So you slink your way over. How close do you want to get to the shipwreck in your little scouting mission here?
the tree line is probably 50 yards of beach. So if you get directly as close as you possibly could to the shipwreck, but still be like right behind a tree trunk in the woods, um, it's about 50 feet of, of beach sand between you and the ship. I'm sorry, 50 yards. Okay, yeah, so you try to get to the closest you can, but stay in the wood, in the woods cover. Okay, so you get closer. Um, so the first thing you notice that kind of, oh, give me, and now for our second roll, go ahead and give me a perception check to see how well you're able to pick out details. Nailing it, nailing it, 19. All right. Um, so the first thing you notice right away that kind of catches your, makes your ears twitch a little bit is that you're not hearing a lot of forest jungle sounds. Um, so although your stealth is fantastic and most things aren't able to see you, something has everything pretty quiet. So you're not hearing the frogs, you're not hearing any of the birds, you're hearing the, the subtle lapping of the waves. The, the sea seems to be in one of its calmness at the moment, so it's not big crashing waves. It's really kind of like a, uh, almost like a vacation spot kind of idyllic scene, except for the big ship that's rotting here on the beach. Um, and as you get closer, you do see the fishing skiff which is um, next to the ship. It would be, you guys came from the east. So the first thing is the little fishing skiff next to the ship. And then right to the west of that would be um, the big ship. And it looks like a, a typical merchant ship. Um, something that you've seen pull into uh, salt break many times. The fishing skiff, uh, you got a 19, is pretty good. From what you can see, it looks like it's a small kind of fishing skiff that might have one or two people normally in it. It looks like it's something that paddles. It has a little outrigger that, um, like a little pontoon outrigger on it. And then it's like almost like a carved out canoe almost type thing. And then you can tell that the, uh, the central part of it is filled with fish and netting. Um, and with a 19, let's say you pick up a little bit of the sea breeze and you pick up a little bit of the smell that's kind of coming in off the cove, and you you get a really strong smell of rotting fish. Mm. Like more than you would normally get, obviously being near the ocean. How close is that little boat to the wreckage? Probably a 20 or 30 foot span. It looks oh, like it's okay. very close. Nope, looks looks like a it looks like a well used fishing outrigger, um, but it looks in perfect working order. You can see the paddles still sitting in it. You can see the nets. It looks like it's been pulled up onto the beach so that it, the the tide wouldn't take it. Um, and that's all you see from from fifty yards away. Nope, nothing like that at all. Okay. Yeah, so you keep an eye on it um, and, and maybe you can get a few angles of it as you look around. Um, you have such a good uh, stealth skill, you could even climb a tree and still look. And from what you can tell, you're not seeing any movement. Every now and then it creaks, but you're pretty sure that's just the, the waves kind of will settle it a little bit and then it'll settle down again every now and then when a wave comes in. And they're not big waves by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you're hearing just things to you that would sound like a creaking ship, you know, just sitting up on a beach. Yeah, see, oh, so you want to go a little deeper into the woods? Yeah, um, near the ship, it's definitely much quieter. Um, halfway back towards where your group is, where you know they are, you know, 
back up along the beach, you start to hear the, the, the sounds of birds again and frogs and such. So it's something definitely closer, um, more east in the woods than west. The more you travel west, the more things um, seem to go back to normal as far. But it's not real loud either. Um, like during the day for hours, it was a pretty loud cacophony of different things that you could hear. It's much more subdued or su um, subdued here next to your group or near your group. And it was definitely really quiet down closer to the ship. <laughs> well, as always, like a ghost. I look hmm. at Blaze and say, we're definitely going to be heard if we come marching in. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, can, can someone may, can we make like a survival or a nature check or something to see if we, you know, can think of, you know, oh, the jungle always goes quiet when there's a tarask in the bush or something. Can we, <laughs> can we do something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. E each of you could... Um, you've all had training, and, and part of that's been woods and jungle training. So, yeah, we can do a survival check to see if any of you recall some reasons why you might think that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. We love you, Yaziri. Yaretsi. Oh, nice. So, Griselda oh, and Yaretsi, um, you remember from your training, and it was obvious that maybe Blaze and... and Eglith weren't listening during that day, that, that lecture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, yeah, there are things in the woods that uh, birds and frogs and all of that, like uh, wild cats, um, large creatures moving through. Um, also, you've known around the village areas every now and then there are... Um, packs of things like goblins or orcs and things that sometimes uh, go through Velen. And it's it's very easy to, if you're paying attention while you're out in the, the jungly forest, to know when a group or a band of them is going by because everything has gotten really quiet. It's very similar to, you know, just about any, any type of big predator is going to make those things kind of go quiet. Anything that, you know, those things perceive as being a, a, a large predator. Hmm. And actually, Griselda, you might even you might even put forth, you know, well, and and that's just talking about natural causes. Obviously, there could be any number of unnatural reasons something, you know, could might I go quiet. Perhaps do an arcana check and see if maybe something's magical around. Yeah, yeah. If you can think of, yeah, yeah, give us a roll and see. That's a pretty good roll. So um, you know, arcana wise. Um, there are things, there are magical energies that would silence an area. You know there are spells that will do that. And you do know that nature can sometimes react to large discharges of magical power. Um, you don't have any evidence that that's what's happened here, but you know that those are some of the things that also might lend itself to the woods or the, or the forest going quiet. So possibly a large creature of some kind by the sounds of it. Hmm. Well, we're here to investigate and explore. I think we found out that it's safe enough at least to approach. So we I vote that we approach. Good call. <laughs> I'm going to hide behind you guys. <laughs> <laughs> 
the DM votes that you approach too, because that's what he's prepared for the adventure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey guys, let's turn around and go home. We're done. It's good. <laughs> Okay, so with Blaze at my side, if he's a, if he's ready, I, I start walking forward and uh, you two can be right behind us. So do you approach weapons out and ready? Do you approach nonchalantly, non-aggressively? What, what's the posture as you approach? Great yeah, sword like this. I think I've got my shield in one hand and I've got my, uh, my war hammer in the other. Not necessarily at the ready to swing, but definitely like by my side in my hand. All right, so definitely looking like you're ready, though. Okay, so yeah. So you guys, uh, and walking along the beach, or are you going to take the woods route? I think walk along the beach for me, if that sounds okay. Good idea. I like it. Okay, so you guys walk your way along the beach, and the first thing you come up to is you're getting closer and closer, and you, and you probably smell kind of rotting fish. The smell of it gets a little bit stronger. The closer you get to the fishing skiff, um, and that's the first thing you kind of come up to. Do you approach all the way up, or is there a certain point where you want to stop? Uh, I'm not afraid of a skiff. I'll, I'll just keep walking unless unless someone who's much more perceptive than I kind of like puts a hand out or something. Okay, yeah, so you guys have walked right up. You see no movement um, thus far, and you get up to the skiff, and, and when you're looking inside the skiff, it, you see a lot of fish. In the center area, you see the paddles that are used to, to paddle this fishing skiff. You see nets that are used to catch the fish. But other than that, um, there's nobody in the skiff. Could I do a perception or survival check to kind of see how long these fish have been dead to gauge how long this boat's been here? Yeah, everybody could do, if you're going to start looking around and you feel like um, you want to start investigating, like kind of trying to find clues, yep, everybody can do an investigation roll. Okay. I'm not good at investigation, guys. <laughs> yeah, Bla Blaze isn't even going to roll that. He stands guard. Okay. So I'm like poking at the fish, totally. Yeah, yeah, you're like, like <laughs> you're like, these are dead fish. These are, they're yeah. definitely dead. Wait, let me, yeah. yes, yes. Maybe, maybe for a day, maybe for two weeks could be dead fish. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Griselda takes a look at it and she knows immediately. I mean, she looks at those fish and knows these fish have been out in the sun for exactly one day. I mean, almost down to the hour. She's like, these have probably been here for 17 hours. Mm. No good for soup. Rotting. Right. Gross. Definitely a day. Definitely. And then Griselda, the other thing you notice, everybody's kind of paying attention to the skiff. You actually notice too that you see footprints in the sand that appear to lead from the fishing skiff and they appear to walk over to the other ship and it looks like it goes into the big hole into the side is where those footprints lead to. Look, guys, there's footprints. I can see them. Going into the ship. I'm, I'm focused on the fish right now. Just let me... <laughs> Still trying to figure out what kind of fish are these? What I know I've had they? these. <laughs> no, Ed goes, looks dead. over and, and looks at whatever uh, uh, Griselda's pointing at. <laughs> yeah, so you see a set of tracks. They appear to be uh, humanoid booted so, you know somebody wearing um some type of boots or sandals of some sort um they don't look very big they look you know regular size similar to like your guys's tracks on the beach and they appear like they go from the skiff where you can see some tracks where wh whoever this was pulled the boat up onto the beach further out of the water and then it looks like that person walked over and then entered the hole in the fishing ship well, I'm guessing this isn't somebody that's dangerous because they're probably just fishermen that got washed up here and were seeking some shelter or they are explorers themselves. Maybe they're looters. Possibility. Let's go. I vote, yeah, let's follow these foot footprints and head into the ship. 
Yeah, so you guys walk over to the ship and you're getting closer to it. You hear the creaks of the ship as it's moving towards the water. And you can see kind of this big dark hole on the side of it. You can't even tell what would have caused the hole. It's a lot of rotting wood and such around it. As you move away from the skiff, the, the smell of the rotting fish starts to dissipate a little bit. So it's obvious that the, that the smell is coming from the fishing boat. You see the tracks lead up to, on the beach, up to, um, and go inside, basically, the hull of the ship. But you also see a set of tracks that looks like some type of large object or large something is being dragged. It just has this big drag mark, and instead of going back to the fishing boat, it's being dragged up into the woods. So they came in here and picked up something and dragged it out of the ship into the woods? Is that what it looks like? Yeah, Griselda definitely thinks that with her. And, yeah. and even, your, even your role isn't bad enough to even, yeah, I mean, that's the impression you're getting. How, how big is the truck mark? of the object probably something that was about two feet wide it obviously was heavy because they're dragging it it wasn't like they were just picking something up and then you just see footmarks it's they're dragging something um to the woods and it's leaving about a two feet wide maybe two and a half foot wide dragging mark but it's really hard to say what it might be from just scrapes in the sand is it one continuous scrape, like a kind of one track? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's heavy enough that this person, I mean, and your, your role is so good. I mean, in your head, you're envisioning somebody picking up one end of something. It must mm -hmm. be heavy and then dragging it up to the woods. But you don't see any other tracks other than those. Okay. Oh, puzzles, puzzles. Maybe you want to go further into the ship or do we want to follow this new set of tracks we should probably check out the ship first yeah and maybe if we go in the ship we can see if there's other objects and maybe we'll know what they took all right i'll lead then i just start stomping off towards the ship by the All way, right, yeah, sorry, so... PB. This is another another Greybeard-like character. Another one. <laughs> he only plays Greybeard. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you kind of trudge your way in, and and obviously the couple of you know the guys with armor are making more noise, but you're not really hearing anything. And the first thing you do is when you get into the hold, um, you can tell that you're basically in the bilge area of the ship. So what you see is the bottom of the ship and you see all these spars that are all the different ribs of the ship. And just above your head appears to be some type of deck. And then a little further in, you can see where it's wet and water has gotten in. You see like a hole that appears to be a way, it's like a probably a five foot, five foot by five foot hole that leads up on top of what you would guess would be the bottom deck of the ship. And when you're looking in there, um, it's dark. You can, there is enough light coming in from some of the holes, but it's still kind of dark. And the only thing you see in the bilge is water. You see stones, um, which are typically, you would know, are used for ballast to keep the ship a certain way. Um, and, and this this is kind of the very lower part. This would be a part that is not normally accessed very often in a ship. Is is there a way through that isn't? Um, we don't have to get wet. No, you you have to get your feet wet a little bit, even get into the hole a little bit. It's not like it's deep or anything. It's maybe shin high when you get up to the, where the hole is and then you step inside. And there's water in here, which looks like maybe the waves to put water in. There's always going to be some water in these wooden ships. That's just how they are. Um, so you're going to be walking through like ankle deep water inside the ship too. And it is a salt water. This is an ocean, so it's all kind of salt water. Well, do we want to slosh through here or climb our way to the top and work from top down? Uh, I think for bottom up, right? If we climb up to the next level. 
eventually we'll make it to the deck. All right, works for there me. There has to be a captain's quarters or something that might give us a clue to more about this area. All right. But that's going to be further up. Bla Blaze will leap in. Yeah, so you, you, you go in and you walk through some ankle uh, deep water, and then you get to the five-foot opening, which is just a hole in the, in the deck there. And as you kind of pop your head up, you can see that this is the bottom deck of the ship, and this is where you see old cargo netting. You see um, a few rows of broken barrels. Um, and such. So this definitely looks like the cargo section of the ship. And then it looks like there's some stairs that lead up towards the back that look like they lead up to the other deck. Um, from there, you're not seeing any movement. It's definitely much darker here. There's not as many holes letting light in in this spot. Griselda, would you cast light on my shield? And I'm going to pop up with my shield and see if I can get a brighter look. Sure. So, Griselda, she touches the shield and it glows with an amber light, like the area around it. Cool. And then I kind of pop my head up and lift my arm with my shield and kind of look around, see if I can get a better look. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about your shield. What kind of what shape is it? What kind of shield oh. is this? And let me let me look at my picture because that's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a thick metal shield. Um, and gosh, I didn't really think about this, but it's got a, actually it's not all metal. We'll say it's a thick wood shield with like a metal rim on the outside and some, some inlay bands of metal kind of holding, um, the emblem of Loviatar in the center. Nice. Which what is, is that um, yeah. it's like a cat of nine tails. Per... Oh, nice. <laughs> all right. So yeah, so your shield is blazing and light in front of you you're able to kind of light up the whole area as you get in and yeah you're definitely in a cargo area um but it looks like everything is just as rotted and cracked open as um the ship itself it looks old you get the impression that it's that it's just been worn and, and torn for a very long time uh nothing seems to be secured down anymore everything seems to be smashed open mostly it's just rotting wood you're not really even seeing stuff like other stuff besides rotting wood um as you climb up in there is anybody else gonna jump up and investigate with them or yeah everybody kind of climbs up and in i'll uh i'll ask uh, griselda if she can get a hand up the space sorry i missed what you said Oh, I, I asked Griselda, basically Blaze turns and he says, would would you like a, hell, a hand up? And he like, yes, puts, you know. Please. Right. <laughs> I wish I wasn't so short. <laughs> you guys have wet ankles. I have wet thighs. Yeah. They're definitely, they're all hunkered over because the space to the first deck, there's probably only about four and a half feet, maybe five feet of space. Yeah. So you have to kind of crawl or duck under in the bilge until you get to the, the cargo deck area. And the cargo deck area is probably a full like seven foot area. So if you're taller than seven foot, you're bending over also. Yeah. But yeah, so okay. So yeah, he lifts you up and then Blaze climbs up behind. Again, still not hearing anything. And you guys kind of do a, a quick check of the entire cargo deck and you come to a spot where you see um, a chest that has its lid open. And when you're looking at it, it's, it's an old rickety chest. You see a bunch of gold pieces in the chest. Hmm. I'm not a particularly greedy person, but this <laughs> looks pretty inviting. <laughs> oh, alarm bells are ringing. <laughs> Can I check for traps? Uh, you can't. It is open. It's already opened. Um, but yeah, you can certainly go ahead and do a... You could do... Well, what role do you think you would want to do there? Your investigation check, or do you want to do something else for that? Uh, the character sheets. In. Let's see. Thieves tools. Tool check, maybe. Yeah, I guess you could do that. But I would go with whatever you have the highest in. Let's see. Well, I have 
eye for detail as uh, part of my archetype, the inquisitive rogue, for those of you curious. And um, I can use, I guess, a bonus action uh, to make a wisdom perception check to spot a hidden creature or object. Or yeah, I to, think that'd be a good use for it. Or I could make an investigation check to uncover and decipher clues. So, yeah, perception. Yeah, pick one. I will yep, whichever pick one you want. Here we go. Ah, uh, that's more like my rolls. That's <laughs> so that's more comfortable. Actually, the, that's still good enough. Ten's good enough. So you're looking at the chest. It's obviously old. It's obviously been opened. Um, there is no, when you're looking at the underneath of the mechanism, there was no trap on the underneath of the mechanism. The lock that was on it is laying, is laying kind of half open. Um, and it looks like somebody has cracked it open, but you do recognize that sitting right next to it is a space for a very similar, if not exact size chest, but seems to be missing. Oh, I relay that to the group. So somebody opened this, and it wasn't what they wanted. That's hmm. really odd, considering it's full of gold. Mm -hmm. I yeah, wonder... and with, oh, with your check, you're probably your best guess is it's probably somewhere in the vicinity of uh, five hundred gold pieces in the chest. Oh wow! <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, it, as one of my personality traits, I have thinking is for other people. I prefer action, so I familiar. start getting a. <laughs> I get I get uh, I get a bag out or something, or start putting the the gold in in a container, other than this busted up chest. All right, so you guys see Blaze uh, get one of the sacks out that he has, and he's just stuffing the money into the sack. Um, I reach my hand in while he's doing this. I kind of just reach my hand in there. I'm not taking any gold, but I want to see like how deep it goes. And I and then I lift up and I kind of let coins fall out of my fingers. Yeah, yeah, it goes to the bottom and it appears that this chest was holding a bunch of these golden coins. Um, you recognize some of the gold coins. Some are of different factions that maybe you've never seen before. Some are things you've seen traded with, so some of it is recognizable. They're not all identical. Um, and so it's kind of an assortment of different gold coins. But they're all of similar shape and of the normal shape that would be used for trading all through the Sword Coast and all through these southern coasts. Hmm. When I get that first sack filled, I, I look over at Eglith and I'm like, I've heard that uh, your kind can carry lots of weight. Would you uh, be willing to tote this? <laughs> uh, yeah, and he easily picks it up and he's just like, well, this isn't lots of weight. And I store it with the rest <laughs> of my stuff. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Cool. So it only takes you a minute or two to, to fill up maybe one or two sacks of, you know, 500 gold pieces. And it's it's right around 500 gold pieces. You guys can write it down. But you now have several sacks of 500 gold pieces and an empty rotted out chest. Um, and that's about all you find in the cargo hold area. Everything else is smashed. Um, nothing else is, is even in there. Like there's nothing, there's not even like broke pottery or other trade goods or anything that's all pretty empty it's most of the containers are smashed and emptied um in this cargo deck area maybe they had finished trading all of their cargo and were heading back home and that's why it's empty onward and upward <laughs> onward um <laughs> Yeah, so you guys see a set of stairs, a set of wooden stairs that lead up to the, the main deck. And when you come up onto the main deck, so you're on the main deck, and you can see up forward, there's a set of stairs that go up to um, kind of the, the front end of the area of the deck. And then the back end is like you see a door that's been just used to be a door. It's like half a door. Um, it looks rotted in the same. Everything, and, and what's funny to you is probably it doesn't look like it's been disturbed in many years um and as you kind of take a look you still don't see any movement and it's obvious the back part of the the ship the aft part of the the ship 
is probably, like you said, some type of corridor area in the back, and there's another set of stairs that go up to the very top of that for um, being up on top of that area. All right, I'll start heading towards the half door. Okay. Yeah, so you you go up to that. Um, you kind of – it looks like the half door has just been rotted out more than anything. Um, and you just – as you even just push the door a little bit, it just falls off its hinges from rot. And you look in there, and it is a, it's a cabin, but everything is just wood, rotted wood. You don't even see – it looked like it's – they might – like, you think that pile of rotted wood probably was a dresser, but it doesn't even look or resemble <laughs> like a dresser anymore. That pile of rotted wood and whatever might have been a bed or something. This pile of rotted wood could have been something else, but there doesn't seem to be anything else in here but just rotted wood and, and the decaying ship. And I, I'll look back at everyone and I'll be like, gold doesn't rust. Let's check it out. And I walk in. I yeah. follow him. Oh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so he, just even after a few minutes, you even poke through all of the, the the rubble that's in there, and you don't find anything else but more rotting wood, seaweed. Um, that's about it. All right. Let's you, keep you moving. You do get the impression that this is not a ship that wrecked, like, a week ago. Like, you're, <laughs> you're not getting that impression. Yeah. You're getting the impression of this ship has been in a bad state for years. All right. Uh, I, I look at Eglith and I don't say anything, but I start watching the floorboards more um, just to make sure that if we're going to start going up, that there's, there's not soft spots where, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm clocking in at over 200 some pounds myself. Yeah. So I'm checking for me, but I'm making sure for Eglith also. And uh, yeah. let's keep searching. Yeah, and you do see stuff like that. You see places where there's definitely weakness in the floorboards that they've used. So you're kind of moving around them. They're obvious, so it's not, like, too big of a deal. Um, if you go back out of that room and then you go back up the stairs, you're up on top of that. This is the area where they kind of would steer the ship. And you see a, a broken uh, wheel um, that they would use. It's also a place where they can keep lookout. And you see the masts are kind of broken and, and half turned over. Um, nothing up on the top. You have a good view of the cove at this point. And you can see down into the fishing skiff. <clears throat> There's nothing on the other side of the ship. You get a little bit better look at the tracks. Um, and you can see, again, the tracks that lead to the hull of the ship and then go off into the woods, all the way back up into the woods. Um, and even from up on this deck, which at the back one is even taller, you can see up on the forward deck, there's just nothing up there either. It's just, you know, old rotted rope, you know, is up there. There's lots of kelp and seaweed, um, lots of rotted wood, and that's about it. Hmm. I guess look towards the bow of the ship. Another, like, room that quickly check that out. Yeah, you look all over, and there's there's no other rooms up forward. Um, it looks like it's just a place that stored things like, you know, the ropes and the sails and the, you know, the, the, the rigging that they would use, but all of that's been rotted and is either has gone off the ship or fallen off the ship or was taken off the ship. You're not really sure which, um, no other rooms that you're finding, no other signs of people. You're not seeing tracks or anything like that. Seems to be pretty empty. Oh, I'm going to say mission accomplished guys. Seems to be we've cleared out everything in this creepy old ship. <laughs> uh, perhaps we should explore into the forest. Well, we know that they've got another box of... <laughs> and something probably more valuable than 500 gold pieces. Yeah, let's go investigate. So I think we're going to leave back down through the ship and follow the tracks the large wide track okay um in your typical marching order yeah uh, right. i'll i'll ask eglith uh, do you think you could suffer to carry uh griselda on your back through the water she doesn't need <laughs> a second soaking <laughs> uh sure if that's what she wants to do oh right. please <laughs> <laughs> So I'll hoist her up and put her on my uh, 
on my shoulder, I guess. <laughs> so everybody, as you're walking along the tracks and you're you're keeping an eye up to the the, the forest, um, go ahead and make a history check. Not good at those. Oh, but oh, I did. Oh, snap, Blake. Okay. Beat my 19. <laughs> yeah, 19 and 20 are really good. Perfect. Uh, and, and Eglet, not bad. You know, 12 still pretty good. 12. I totally bad. saw the 19 and thought it was mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I... Oh. <laughs> so... Blaze, in a rare moment of paying attention um, <laughs> to kind of what's going on around him, he's like, isn't there another town near here? And you realize that there is another town that's probably within a day's travel from here, knowing your geography. And and Yuretsi, you actually um, are kind of nodding and confirming yet that, yeah, you guys are probably a day away from um, a town called... Uh, edge cliff and even though the the beach kind of winds along to the east and then it goes south for a while and then it winds back north again and then goes east so if you were to take a boat it probably would take you longer to get to edge cliff but you guys are kind of what what strikes you is you're thinking about location wise it feels like you're almost like you're heading towards where edge cliff should be and it's probably only a day's walk through the woods Versus if you were to stay on the shoreline, it might take you two days to wind all around to get back around to it. Well, this reminds me of the Isle of Dread. If we just cut straight through like a pterodactyl flies, we could get to Edgecliff in a day, I believe. How long Has anyone we ha been to Edgecliff before? Good question. Mm. Uh... Yeah, we'll go off of your... Probably that's why you have the, the history check. So we'll say two of you, Yuretsi and Blaze, have probably stopped in there. And you know that it is a small fishing village, much smaller than Salt Break. Um, definitely more um, fishing structures, maybe a temple, if you recall. Um, there's some townsfolks there, very few merchants of any type. Um, definitely not like Salt Break. And this is the general direction of where those tracks lead, or have we lost those because it's yeah, no that's, longer in the sand? No, that's, what, that's probably what triggered the thing, is that the tracks are kind of leading towards that, that direction. Can we tell how old the tracks are, any of us? Did we, did we determine that? Um, we no, somebody looking? would need to do a survival check. You might be able to pick up on how old these are. There you go. Whoa. Whoa. Some big nice. numbers coming out. Oh, a plus seven. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. So all of you are like paid attention during tracking. Class. And all of you realize that, yeah, probably. And, and each of you are probably like, yeah, it was definitely maybe not a day old. And then, um, uh, Griselda says, nope, definitely 17 hours ago these tracks were made. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was seeing it, yeah, I was seeing it like one upping. Uh, Blaze is all like, here's the tracks. Uh, they're probably, uh, I don't know. And then each person says something until, she, until you know, Griselda's like, bam. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> She's a wizard. Wizards are nerds. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're definitely, I mean, you're getting such good rolls. You can tell all of you got pretty good rolls. It's definitely one person dragging something heavy into, it, it makes it super easy on the beach. And even when you start to get into the woods, you can see it as it's broken leaves and branches, and the person is stumbling through the woods, trying to make a near beeline towards what um, Blaze and uh, Yuretsi thinks is towards Edgecliff. Well, I think I'll get my weapon at the ready and we can start following this further, but I want to be prepared. How okay. long did uh, the lady who gave us this job tell us we had to come back? 
Uh, she said that she would expect you back in a week. Oh, okay. Um, so you guys had like a, a two day travel to get there. Um, she assumed, you know, two day travel back. It, she wouldn't know how long it would take you to, to clear out or whatever it was. But, you know, before that, they would maybe send a search party or, or send, you know, a, a larger force down to see what happened. And Forgotten Realms, 10 day weeks, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. Well, let's. I mean, we should be faster than this fellow. If yeah, they're dragging so something heavy. Catch up to him. All right. So let's uh, let's end our scene a moment as our our party of Blaze and Egleth crash into the woods and begin to kind of follow this trail that's already being kind of blazed through this jungle forest, I keep calling it, with Yuretsi and Griselda bringing up the rear and keeping their eyes on everything that's around them. I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take our first five-minute break to let everybody uh, fill up their drinks or use the restrooms real quick, and then we'll come back uh, in five minutes, and we will continue into the dark jungle forest. Cool. Hey. Sounds good. See you in five. All right, so I have the break screen up.